if you pay yourself last, you'll always have unexpected bills and you get further behind. If you pay yourself first, you'll end up having order, re reorganizing the system instead of disorder taking over. Many years ago, uh, over 20 years ago, I was living in New York and I was walking down the street on um, Madison Avenue and I went to an Italian restaurant and all of a sudden that title, How to Make One Hell of a Props that Took It to Heaven, popped in my head and I quickly wrote it on a napkin and I turned it into a book. And the main objective of that title that popped in my head was that so many people had difficulty holding on to money and receiving it and feeling worthy of it and allowing themselves to build financial independence. Not everybody feels comfortable doing that. Some people immediately do and think, oh, of course, why would, why would we not? But then there's some people that had difficulty with that. So I'd like to address that and share with you some ideas that can be helpful to you in transcending that concern, if you do, about somehow the reception and accumulation of financial independence. You know, if we work a whole lives for money, we're like a slave to it. But if we have it work for us, we're like its master. I'd much rather be a master of the money and not have it run my life than allow it to run my life and live day to day and survive. I'm not interested in survival, I'm interested in thrival. So you might wanna take some notes um, on this particular topic. First, I wanna talk about, there's, there's an idea in some quote, religious or spiritual circles that somehow spiritual and material do not somehow coincide. But a very ancient proverb says, spirit without matter is expressionless, matter without spirit is motionless. And the great book of wealth by Hubert Hal Bancroft, which is a classic, uh, he described that, that those are the two driving forces of all human behavior, uh, an inspired spiritual mission and also a material objective. And you know, a, a heaven force, an earth force, sometimes called, but they both need to be integrated. And so I'd like to show how they're really the same and there's no separation between them. So people can have a mindset that is more receptive to allowing themselves to have a financial life and abundance in their life. So each of us have uh, what is called personas and we also have a true being. So maybe you wanna write this down, but We've all had moments when we've exaggerated ourselves and puffed ourselves up with pride and got a bit, um, you know, inflated and arrogant and self-righteous and elevated in who we are and puff ourselves up. When we do, we tend to project our values onto other people and expect others to live in our values. We've all been in a relationship somewhere probably that we said, you know, you should, you ought to, you're supposed to, you got to, you have to, you must, you need to. You projected expectations of your values onto other people and expected them to live according to what you expect. When you're resentful to people and put them down and see them beneath you, you tend to get puffed up and start to act that way and project. And that wakes up a narcissistic side where you believe that you're more important than the person that you're talking to. And you get a little arrogant, talk down to them. And when you do, you start to think, well, I deserve and they deserve to give up what they want for what I want. And this is a narcissistic uh, side of the equation. And you try to get something for nothing. And you try to sacrifice others for you. And you want them to live in your values. And this is non-sustainable. Eventually, you get pride before the fall, and you eventually get humbled and brought back down because people, if you do that to customers, you don't make any income. If you do it to employees, they don't want to work for you, and you have to, they, they, you have to pay them more and more and more to put up with that type of behavior. So nature then eventually humbles that back down into more of an equitable position. If you minimize yourself and deflate yourself, and you have a self-raunchous persona, if that's a word, uh, low self-esteem or an inferiority complex or minimization of self. And you go in the other direction and you think I need to sacrifice for others. And I put them on pedestals. We've all been in situations where we put people on pedestals and then didn't want to lose them in our life. And so we end up sacrificing what was important to us to be with them. And that minimization kind of creates an altruistic where we now 
are willing to give something for nothing. Think about it very carefully. When you have been in a situation where you're around somebody that's very, very highly admired, you'll give up some of the things that are normally important to you to, to fit in with them. And at the other time, if you resent them, you try to get them to fit into you. So here, now, when you minimize yourself, you'll tend to sacrifice for others and you'll tend to give something for nothing, kind of an altruistic side. So I've said for years that altruism is, is compensation for shame and guilt of the past and self-minimization and a hidden agenda of the future, which is some sort of a reward. And um, narcissism is compensation for pride and self-righteousness past. And again, a hidden agenda of the future, which ends up being philanthropy to get back. So nature is automatically, if it's trying to get something for nothing or give something for nothing is non-sustainable. But if you actually have equity, that means that you and they are equal. You're not superior, not inferior, just equal to them. And you respect them and you respect you. You create what is called a sustainable fair exchange. And a fair equitable exchange in a relationship means you do a service, they pay a reward and it's comparable to the service, and it's not more or less than what that service deserves in both your and their eyes. And now you have a, an affair exchange, and you both want to go back to the drawing table and continue your business. And all transactions, whether it be business-related or social-related friendships, or whether it be uh, loved ones, um, family, or spouses, uh, if it's if everybody's keeping an inventory, there's a thing called equity theory that actually dis describes this this innate knowing for a fair exchange. We have an intuition that's trying to get fair exchange and trying to allow us because if we puff ourselves up or beat ourselves up, minimize ourselves, we're not being ourselves. And we want to be our true to ourselves. We want to be loved for who we are. And we're not being who we are when we exaggerate and minimize ourselves. And we're not allowing them to be who they are if they're exaggerating and minimizing themselves. So nobody wants to do business when they don't be able to be themselves. So that's why a narcissistic or altruistic polarities eventually create a non-sustainable dynamic. And what's interesting is that you've even heard cliches like it's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, if it's more blessed to give than receive, the person giving is blessed, but the person receiving doesn't get to give. And so they're cursed. That neither one of those are true. What, what's true is the fair exchange, sustainable fair exchange where you're doing something, et cetera. And the reason why people feel good about giving is because they feel shame and guilt, and it feels less shame and guilt when they're giving than when they're taking. And when they're narcissistic, it's the other way around. They feel good if all of a sudden people give back because they feel that they deserve it. So these are two polarities, the self-righteous, the self-raunchous, the build, the, the destroy, the inflated, the deflated self that creates a non-sustainable fair exchange. And that's not equanimity. That's not equity. That's not authenticity. When we're authentic and we're actually in a state where we have fair exchange and true love, not looking down on people with resentment, not looking up at people with infatuation, but looking across with people with caring. This one's careless. This one's careful, walking on eggshells. This is caring, which keeps the rings on the finger. In that caring state, we have the most sustainable fair exchange. And that is our authentic, loving, inspired state. That's our spiritual state. That's why the mastery of fair exchange economically have the same roots. In fact, morality comes from axiology, the study of values and worth, and morality actually impacts spiritual constructs as well as economic constructs. So there is absolutely no separation in the way I teach it. There's no separation between mastering wealth building, which means well-being, whole being, in fact, you'll see that the well-being of an individual and the overall, uh, you know, consciousness of the individual is enhanced by socioeconomic development. If you look at the countries that are socioeconomically developed, there's more order and organization there, more opportunities there. And if it's lower socioeconomics, then there's less opportunities and more crime and more prejudice and things of this nature, typically. So you end up having a, a really a reward for mastering your life. And when it comes to business, if you go and do something that fulfills people's values, I was speaking at a church, oh, 20 years ago, maybe, and uh, uh, there was a minister there, and we had a chat before I went up and spoke, and we started talking, and I said, uh, you know, is, is your, your congregation growing? It's just been kind of flat for a number of years. I said, well, it means you're not inspired. You're not really filled with that spirit, as you will. You're not inspired. And he goes, well, that's true. And then I said, you got to have a cause, something that's inspiring, something that's meaningful, something engaging. 
well, you know, something you want to build that inspire people to do something. And we decided right there before I went up there to do that, to come up with something that would be meaningful because he wanted to go and upgrade the, the church itself. And so we, we announced it and we actually raised funds that day and got people inspired by it. Because if you give something that's a value to people, people want to participate in an economic exchange. And I told people in the, at that church that time, I said, if you're poor, it's because you're not caring about humanity. And they, they responded like, what? And I said, if you really care about human beings, you're going to go out of your way to find out what the needs are of those human beings and find out who's got the solutions to those problems and then go and deliver it either directly with your own skills or indirectly by brokering and bringing people together and taking a portion because you deserve to be able to help them and get a portion of that. In the process of doing that, you realize that if you really care about human beings to fill the values of other human beings, and you fill it effectively, more efficiently than effectively than somebody else, and you deliver what they're needing is, you're contributing and you're rewarded. You know, I ask people in, in many, many countries around the world, how many of you ever use Microsoft Windows? And every hand, in every country I've been in, every hand goes up. Somewhere in their life, they've used Microsoft Windows. And I said, maybe that's why he's a billionaire. Maybe he's created a, a product that has served vast numbers of people. And if we actually go out of our way and do something that serves vast numbers of people, we get vast opportunities to receive economics. Economics is a measurement of fair exchange, the way I look at it. It's basically a measurement of, are you doing something that's meaningful and it serves people's values and it's an, a fair thing? If they do, they want to continue to do business with you. If they don't, why would they? Why would somebody want to continue business with you if you try to get something for nothing or if they feel uncomfortable because you're trying to give something for nothing? People may try to take advantage of a free free system, but then they, then they feel guilty. And anytime they feel, you know, you know, a cocky or guilty or whatever, they automatically don't they have a feeling of uncomfortableness. We want fair exchange. Study equity theory. Go look it up and you'll see that in, in business transactions, everybody has an intuition to do that. And when they're living by their highest values, they're most objective and that fair exchange is most, most refined. And if they're living by lower values, things that are not inspiring to them, they're in their amygdala and they tend to subjectively bias things and skew things and they throw things out of balance. And then they don't know what fair exchange is and they start getting self-righteous or minimizing themselves. The more we're living by our highest values, the more we're authentic we are, and the more we end up having more fair exchange. When we're ever trying to live by lower priorities, we end up skewing our perceptions and we end up undermining our fair exchange in the process. Now, I found out also that many people are waiting to see if there's extra money at the end of the month before they save and invest money. And I, I learned literally 39, 40 years ago that that's not going to work. There's a thing called entropy in life. Entropy is the tendency to go from order to disorder. And in, and in your financial situation, it follows that law. And if you don't bring order to your finances, disorder takes it over. If you don't invest money as you get it into an asset that goes up in value, therefore working for you passively, you're going to actively have to work all the time and you're going to have unexpected bills show up to erode the possibility of saving. And so that's why the old proverb that the wealthy always paid themselves first and the poor always pay themselves last. If you pay yourself last, you'll always have unexpected bills and you get further behind. If you pay yourself first, you'll end up having order, re reorganizing the system instead of disorder taking over. You know, it's like the same principle in time management. If you don't fill your day with high priority actions that inspire you, it fills up with low priority distractions that don't. If you don't put your money, whenever you get it, into something that goes up in value, it will automatically be attracting situations that make it go down in value. That's why people that devalue themselves typically buy things that go down in value and people that value themselves buy things that go up in value. And if you don't know what an asset and a liability or what a depreciation thing is, then that's worth knowing because every time you take money and you put it into something that goes up in value, it's now working for you and you're now its master. And every time you buy something that goes down in value, now you're its slave. And what's, what people do is they, when they're not engaged and inspired and fulfilled in what they're doing, uh, in their life, they tend to go into their amygdala. The amygdala wants immediate gratification instead of long-term vision. Then they go and buy other people's brands that are overpriced to make them feel temporarily better. They go and buy that. They've separated pain from pleasure because they now used a credit card and they got the immediate gratification. And then 30 days later, they get pain. 
<clears throat> and the banks love to separate that pleasure and pain because the more you separate pleasure and pain, the more addicted you are to getting the quick pleasure and the more frustrated you are by the pain 30 days later. But the wise individual doesn't, doesn't go and buy immediate gratification. They go build a brand around their own life by serving people. And then when they do, then people want to buy their brand. And then they put their monies into something that's an asset that grows up in value. If you buy stock and buy companies and you help productivity in the society and you help companies go and reach more people with more services, you get rewarded by capital gains and you get also <clears throat> dividends and you get you know a passive growth of income. <clears throat> but if you keep buying something like a pair of shoes or something, unless it's absolutely essential and it helps you grow your business, it immediately goes down in value. Every time you buy something goes down in value, well, you're going down in value, you're, you're working against you. You're gonna be working uh, for the, as a slave. And if you do, you're gonna pay the most taxes. And if you go and invest, you're gonna pay less taxes. The, the world and the, the governments actually reward people to save so the government doesn't have to rescue people later on. So in the process of doing it, if you save and invest your money and start having your money work for you, you become its master. <clears throat> and people who feel self-depreciated and they feel guilty and shamed have difficulty investing and saving. They don't feel worthy. And so as a result of that, they go out and buy stuff that temporarily gives them a brand and they go, oh, I'm showing off a brand to other people that don't really care to make them temporarily feel good. And a day later, they forgot about it, but they've now got the bill that comes in and they get going and get themselves further in debt. And I think that that's uh, basically a slavery. We are slaves to money if we buy things that go down in value. We're a master of money if we buy things that go up in value. I didn't understand that until I turned about 27 years old and, uh, and I realized that, wow, when I asked certain questions to my life and uh, started asking, how am I spending my money? If you've never stopped and really looked at where your money's going and really look, is this really priority? Is this really important? Is this really the thing that's going to get me ahead or is this going to keep me entrapped? And you'll be surprised. A lot of the stuff that you buy are immediate gratifying depreciables, consumables that go down in value. And half of your life is paying off debt. And that's not, you don't have to live that way. It's a choice. And what's interesting, the more you do, the longer that, that continues, the more likely you're losing the time of compound interest, the more it's working against you. But if you start buying assets at a young age and start letting it compound, compound interest works for you. And it's much, much wiser to have compound interest work for you than compound interest work against you. Credit card debt is insane. I haven't had a credit card in 39 years. I, I don't waste my time on those things because what they do is you're paying ridiculous. Unless you pay it off on time at the beginning of the month, then it's fine. You're leveraging and using it and organizing it. But don't, don't let it accumulate interest and do it. The average person stores about 10% of their gross income per year on a credit card debt at 20% or, or month more. And that's insane. So the wise thing to do is to actually take a portion of whatever you earn and put it into something that goes up in value. And when you manage money wisely, you receive more money to manage and value yourself. If you're feeling guilty or shame about something, find out whatever you did, find out how it served the people because you, you're unconscious of the upsides. That's why you're beating yourself up. And if you beat yourself up, you'll tend to go into an altruistic giving away and then you'll try to feel better about yourself by buying consumables and you'll trap yourself. Write down whatever you've done that you think you're ashamed or guilt about. Find out how it served you and other people and release yourself of those illusions. In my Breakthrough Experience program, the program I do, I have people every week and they come in with those kind of things and I show them exactly what to do to dissolve it. And it's like a big relief off their back. And then they realize I'm worthy. And when they feel worthy, they start to actually start to take a portion of whatever they earn and they start to have it work for them. And they become its master instead of its slave. And then they started buying things that go up in value. And then they go, oh my God, this is not that difficult. This is very simple. And they start to invest in things that help inspire and help produce productivity in society instead of debt. You know, I think our government sometimes is not realizing that getting further in debt and putting in some sort of a socialization process on that and just expecting somebody to get something for nothing, not going to work. It eventually, it eventually pay a price, but actually being productive and doing something that serves people in a sustainable, fair exchange with a true self-worth that you're inspired by that you can't wait to get up in the morning and be of service to do. That is amazing fulfillment levels in life. And I'm a firm believer that you deserve to be able to do what you love every day. If you're not prioritizing your day and doing what's most important and learning how to delegate 
and give job opportunities to other people and extract surplus labor value out of them and let them help get jobs and you get extra work, uh, money for taking the risk and rewards of that and then serving more people, you're passing up a gold mine. There's an abundance of wealth out there. It's just simply taking the time to master your life, master your decisions and priorities, and um, give yourself permission to go out and participate in service. The more, you know, when I stop and think about it, the most moments, most important moments of your life are when you're actually doing some sort of contribution, making a difference and having a fair exchange. It's a very fulfilling life. But trying to get something for nothing doesn't work and try to give something for nothing. Even if you're doing charities, it's wise not to rob people of dignity, accountability, responsibility, and productivity. It's wise to make sure you do something that actually helps them evolve and develop and become independent, but not dependent. Because that's not it. There's a science of giving money away in charities. And if you don't do it, I, I write for a magazine called Jet Set Magazine. I wrote a big thing on philanthropy in there that was well received because a lot of people just assume giving is somehow good, but giving to some organization, you want to make sure that what you're giving to is actually doing what you hope it's going to do and trace it down and find out where every dollar goes and find out what's actually occurring. I found some charities are actually spending most of the money that they're receiving in telemarketing costs in order to get the money. And they're not actually doing some of the things that's going on. And when they do, then they're rescuing people. And instead of actually helping build independence and self-sufficiency to build culture. So you want to make sure that you not only are taking in money and investing money, but also when you're contributing it philanthropically, that you do it wisely and care about people because robbing them of dignity, accountability, responsibility, and productivity is not caring. But giving them an inspiration and an incentive and catalyzing a growth possibility where they can go out and do something to raise more opportunities for other people and more jobs, more fulfillment, more services, and help the economy, everyone wins that way. So you learning that and you exemplifying that's the greatest teacher for other people. You want to train your children on that? Go and do it. Don't say something and then not do it. Go do it. And you don't have to say anything and they follow it. If you go out and do something extraordinary with your life and serve people and go become financially, you know, profoundly contributive and end up having your money work for you, then by God, you show them what's possible in the world. And there's nothing stopping it. I, I was a street kid when I was a young boy, and I know what it's like to be, you know, go in and get salting crackers and ketchup for dinner or find food on a plate. I know what it's like to be on the streets. I also know what it's like to live in luxury on a, on a yacht. And the reason being is because I, I learned that if I serve ever greater numbers of people, I always say there's six things I found of very wealthy people, care enough about humanity to go out and serve ever greater numbers of people and build a business that does that in an efficient, effective way, manage the business effectively and efficiently so there's profit, so that way you can give a higher quality employee income and also savings to the customer and profits to yourself. And then you go out and, and save an ever progressive portion of those profits and make sure you keep investing it into uh, back into the company and also back into cash reserves and basically start to seed investments and then invest in ever greater degrees of leverage where you're putting money into something of other companies that help, companies that you know will be of real value to people, not gambling type of things, but actually non-zero sum game, productive uh, asset accumulation that helps people in business. And then also accumulating the finances. Purpose of it is not for luxury, not for debauchery, but for actually philanthropic contribution and directing it because you're now exemplifying what's possible for a human being and inspiring other people to want to follow in the steps. And then to go and do something, some cause that inspires you, some philanthropic cause. Because if not, you'll pay most of the taxes to the government and they may socially rescue people instead of actually going out and contributing to something that's truly a value to the, to the individuals and makes them accountable and grow and become independent. So you want to make sure that you actually have a cause greater than yourself to get beyond yourself. When you do, you'll end up having a drive. You know, the, every time you add another dollar to your wealth, the, the value of the additional dollars go down. If you don't have a cause going up to counterbalance it, you'll typically plateau. And the plateau is where you'll stop and stagnate. You want to have kind of something that's inspiring to you that you want to keep doing it. A, more on the bucket list of who you could be of service to. It's very inspiring. I would say money with meaning and purpose uh, leads to philanthropy, but money without meaning and purpose tends to lead to debauchery. And then when you see people that are more debaucherous and blowing money and just squandering money, you end up uh, people that don't have meaning in life. And I think that that's uh, it's given some people the impression that the wealth is somehow uh, evil or something. 
I don't see that at all. I've seen, I know some very wealthy billionaires that are very, very empowered and very, very philanthropic and constantly doing what they can to try to, what is the most significant thing they could do to make the biggest difference in the world? And they're thinking about that daily. And they, because they've served vast numbers of people effectively and efficiently, they drew in the wealth into their life and then now serving people in vast numbers. There are people out there that are doing that full time and it's quite inspiring to watch what's capable. But what we do is we have these misinterpretations. Usually people that don't know how to do that and aren't living that way typically want to judge people who are and they misinterpret it. And then you get that and that's your now mentorship and you get those ideas and you end up thinking that somehow wealth is not good. And that's not true. Wealth meant well-being. If you go look up the word, it comes from the word wheel. It means well-being, whole being, integrated being, authentic being. That's why people that have a higher level of wealth have a higher level of, of uh, you know, impact on the world. They have a higher uh, stealth, uh, health, health status. They have more influence. So I'm a firm believer that you want to master finances. I, don't, I have no desire to go and be uh, and disempowered in any area. I'd say that you've got an intellect you want to empower and wake up an amazing creative genius in your life. You want to build a business that serves numbers of people because it's fulfilling to watch the difference and receive thank yous from people around the world being of service and build your wealth and then have amazing relationship dynamic where you're actually going and seeing the world and experiencing the world. I've asked millions of people, how many of you want to see the world and go to every country? And most people put their hands up. Most people would love to see the world, not just on TV, but actually go and visit cultures. And the more cultures you've seen, you've seen, the more variation of values and the more unconditionally loving you'll be. If you're sitting in one little spot and you think these are the rules of the game and that's just one belief system, you'd be more biased and racial and more limited and tribal. But if you get to see the world, you get to see a, a, a more universal scheme about life and all the variations. And if you socially connect and you make a difference in people's life, people want to be around you. At your death, you don't want to have nobody show up at your death and say, well, I don't know who that person was. You want to say, I made a contribution and left a mark in the world. And physically, you, the, the higher the wealth, the higher the health status you'll have. And spirituality, why not be inspired? One of the, I know a very wealthy billionaire, very inspired by his life and just feels that he's, he's contributing and feel grateful for life. His gratitude quotient is extremely high. So there's absolutely no reason why you can't have a fortune in your life. And, and have inspiration in your life at the same time. I believe that spirit and matter do not have to be separated. And that's why I wrote, you know, how to make a hell of a profit and still get to heaven. Because I really believe that the gratitude is the, when you're appreciative and you're grateful for your life, you get more to be appreciative to. And when you're doing a service and fair exchange, you're going to have people grateful. You're going to be grateful. And that tend to catalyze as new opportunities in, in business and social and, and ultimately in wealth. So I just wanted to share for 20, 30 minutes here, some ideas on, on how to make one hell of a profit and still get to heaven and just some ideas that might make you think differently about finance because you deserve to be living abundantly and living with a prosperous consciousness and be out and serve vast numbers. Get up in the morning and say, I want to make a difference in the world and serve vast numbers of people. Watch what happens to your life. And also, in, a, in addition to what I've just shared, I have a free on-demand masterclass, how to be financially filled doing what you love. Why not do what you love? absolutely inspired. Most people have Monday morning blues, Wednesday hump days, thank God it's Friday's week friggin' ends. Why not do what you love? Why not have fine financial fulfillment doing what you love? That's what I teach in the breakthrough experience, almost all the programs I do, because that way you're not having a go to do work and then having to escape by a, a break, escape by a vacation, escape by retirement to get away from something that's drudgery, to go and spend all your money and wipe that out on, on those things that give you immediate gratification. Why not do what you love and love what you do and get inspired by it and get fulfilled and paid for it? I'm a firm believer that the quality of life is based on the quality of the questions you ask. If you ask questions, how do I get handsomely and beautifully paid to do what I love and being of service to people around the world? The doors of opportunity are there, I promise you. I've taken thousands of people through it, the breakthrough experience, and I'm absolutely certain you can do the same if you just start down the alley and start down the uh, working on that mission. So this is my little presentation. Please take advantage of this masterclass on how to have financial fulfillment, doing what you love. I hope you enjoyed this little presentation. I look forward to seeing you next week. And just make sure that you give yourself permission to do something extraordinary and give yourself permission to reward yourself and have sustainable fair exchange. It really, truly does make a difference. And spirit and matter do not have to be separated. They're one and the same thing in the, at the level of the soul. Nothing is missing at the level of the soul. There's plenty of abundance. I'll see you next week. <music>